In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel text that you just heard records one of Jesus' several sermons that he gave to his disciples shortly before he was arrested and shortly after that killed by the Jews. And he said to the disciples, A little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. Now, it's really rather easy for us to see in retrospect what Jesus meant here. The first little while refers to the few hours that he had left to spend on the earth before he would die on the cross and so leave his disciples. The second little while refers to the three days from Jesus' death on Friday to his resurrection on Sunday when he reappeared to them. And during this time, the disciples would be full of great sorrow and sadness. Jesus even said that they would weep and lament, but the world would rejoice. Of course, we know why the world rejoiced when Jesus was killed and rusted in the tomb. And it's because the world, that is all unbelievers and their ruler, Satan, cannot stand Christ. They cannot stand the truth. They cannot stand Christians. Oh, friends, the world has not changed. Why should you be alarmed that true Christians and true Christian preaching are not tolerated by the world today? The world's rage against Christ and the church continues. Now, on the other hand, Jesus also said to his disciples that this second little while in which they would suffer the world's rage and would weep and lament would not last forever. It would turn into joy. And indeed, Jesus appeared to his disciples that first Easter evening when they were behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. And when he showed them his nail-scarred hands and his side, then they rejoiced and they were glad, just as Jesus said they would. I want to speak with you this morning about this second little while that was filled with suffering, with weeping and lamenting, and that was followed soon after with joy. God wishes, friends, for you to understand that this applies not just to the disciples, but to you as well. This little while of suffering and weeping and lamenting to be followed with joy. I want to consider these four points. First, that all true Christians will be subjected to the little wiles of cross and suffering. Also, our reason cannot understand the cross and suffering. God brings forth many benefits through cross and suffering. And then to those who persevere in the faith through trial and the cross, God brings them great benefits joy, and comfort, heaven itself. All right, pay attention carefully. Do not neglect the preaching of God's word. Rather, hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Now, understand again that what Christ explained to the disciples in our text is for everyone. Here we learn that like the disciples, all Christians must experience the little while of cross, sadness, and suffering. And this suffering is not simply a one-time event that lasts a day or two and then it is over. After all, after all, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Do you get that daily part? The true Christian life, friends, is filled with a continual occurrence of little whiles, that is, crosses and trials. Only when we die will all crosses and trials be lifted from our shoulders, and then our joy, our Christian joy that, that we have, will be unbounded. After the disciples saw Jesus raised from the dead, they rejoiced. Indeed, they were given the true hope of heaven in their own resurrection, something that all true Christians enjoy. But this did not mean that the disciples were now done with all sorrow and suffering. Not at all. Reading the book of Acts clearly dispels that notion. They would later teach the apostles, as Paul did, that it is only through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. 
through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. In other words, you're going to have to go through hell on earth before you get to heaven. And this is contrary to so much of Christian preaching today. Sadly, what I see and hear of preachers is a restrained, if at all, acknowledgement that Christians suffer, but it's quickly dismissed into what can be done to make life easier, better, and with less suffering. So many worship services even seem bent on ignoring Christian suffering. But this is contrary to what God says in his word. What does it say? Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. And friends, how can we expect, how can we expect to escape cross and suffering when our Lord himself experienced it? Just as Jesus, who is our master, experienced it, so shall we, his subjects, his followers. Jesus said, too, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? You can paraphrase that. If I have suffered at the hands of the world, how much more will you? So, friends, hear God ask you today, do you want to be saved? Do you want to place in heaven with me when you die? Then here is my son. Attach yourself to him by faith and by baptism. Let me change you and conform you to Christ your Savior. For in this way you will be saved. Pick up your cross as he did. Learn to suffer with patience and accept the trials that I send your way. I am saving you. Your trials are only momentary. They are only a little while. Be patient. And wait for me to take away your trials and your troubles. I find it fascinating that even the pious Jew who wrote the book of Sirach in the Apocrypha, you should read the Apocrypha at least once in your adult life. And the, the writer of the, this Jewish book of Sirach who wrote we think some hundred years or so before Jesus appeared on earth, he, he knew that God in his wisdom sent cross and suffering to his saints. And he said, my child, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for testing. When you come to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for testing. What happened to Jesus as soon as he was baptized? Trial in the desert with Satan. In other words, do you want to be a Christian and have God's favor? Then prepare yourself for the cross. All true Christians will be subjected to suffering in this life. Now, don't get me wrong and don't get God wrong. When Jesus said to pick up your cross and be willing to suffer daily, he is not saying that peace and joy have no place in the Christian heart. Not at all. He's not giving you allowance to be mopey. Remember what Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart. So what Jesus offers is peace and joy in the midst of cross and suffering. And the great hymns teach this. In thee is gladness amidst all sadness. Right? Jesus' death and resurrection means that all believers can take heart because someday all our own crosses will cease and like Christ we will enjoy peace with God in heaven. And it's for good reason that Jesus called the time of testing of the disciples a little while. Our crosses don't last forever. Elsewhere in scripture, our sufferings and our trials are called light momentary afflictions. They don't feel light, but that is what they are. Now let's move on to the second point, that our reason and natural man cannot understand the mystery of the cross. Notice in our text that the disciples did not grasp Jesus' words about the little wiles. It went over their head, and Jesus knew it. 
what happened with the disciples what is, is what happens to all of us when we follow reason and worldly wisdom. We are unable to grasp the true spiritual value and meaning of suffering in the cross. Now, it's not like worldly wisdom can't teach us a little bit about sacrifice. The ancient Greeks and Romans honored the soldier who suffered defending their armies in their homeland, but there's a difference between this and Christian suffering. For one, Jesus suffered and bore the cross for his enemies, sinners, that they might be saved. This idea was unheard of for Greeks and Romans, suffering for your enemies. Who even today grasps this? The fact is we are unable by nature to grasp the gospel and the great Christian doctrine that God's great tool for saving us and did teaching us the faith is suffering in the cross. And this is due in part to the fact that we think Jesus means to benefit us most in this life, which is just not true, not at all. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not to give us a comfortable earthly life and pat our 401k and give us good health and a family that's more functional than most. The disciples were convinced that Jesus' kingdom was an earthly one. This is why when Jesus was arrested, Peter took up a sword to prevent it. He and all the disciples fled from Jesus in the garden to escape capture, capture. They failed to grasp the meaning behind Jesus' suffering and the cross and how he was using it to save them. Later, when they saw the resurrected Christ and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they began, they began to see and grasp what the prophets had been preaching all along of the suffering Savior and how he would save us through the cross. Isaiah preached about the suffering Christ. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. It took Jesus' resurrection appearance before this started to sink into the disciples' hearts, and it didn't, wasn't an immediate thing. Who of us can say, yep, I've got the cross and suffering all figured out? The disciples were dull about the cross and suffering, and so are we. Recognize yourself in the person of the disciples. Be humble enough to see that you too are just as dull as they were. We too sinfully avoid suffering as they did. We too struggle immensely with how can suffering be valuable. And we too think of Christ's kingdom in terms of this world. Ask God then for his Holy Spirit that you would begin to understand the great mystery and benefit of cross and tribulation, the cross of Christ, and then by extension, your own crosses and sufferings. Let's move on now to the various benefits that God gives us through cross and trial. Indeed, friends, God lays upon us crosses and trials not for our destruction, but for our benefit and are good. He's not being cruel. He's being good. He wants to save us. Notice that in our text, Jesus used the word picture of a woman in childbirth to teach the great joy that follows our little whiles of suffering. He said, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Oh, friends, the cross of tribulation is how God brings forth our rebirth and renewal unto eternal life. Just like childbirth, God saves us through suffering. The mother suffers through childbirth. The ch child suffers through childbirth. 
But when it's all done and that little while is over, there's great joy. There's new life. So does the Christian go through pain and suffering before the joy of heaven. And the fact is, friends, without cross and trial, God's word and faith do not settle into our soul. Salvation through Christ's work on the cross remains a, a, a mental concept. It's, it's something academic that even unbelievers can grasp. But through testing and affliction, God's word and faith is sealed and deeply imprinted into the heart. And we are given rebirth and we are saved. Jesus even said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He might as well have repeated himself and said, unless one picks up the cross, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Friends, besides using suffering to convert us and save us, God also uses the cross and trial to teach us his word. So the psalmist said, it is good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. We all ought to be learning God's word and seeking to mine its treasures. This means taking time to hear faithful preachers and to meditate on God's word, but it also takes suffering to make God's word make sense. I think this concept is understandable to us all. It's one thing to learn in the classroom. It's another thing to get your feet messy and your hands messy with whatever it is you were learning in the classroom. Martin Luther said it was not simply academic studying of scripture and theology that makes a good preacher. Suffering and trial are needed. Suffering and trial is needed to truly grasp the joy of the gospel and the forgiveness of sins. A third benefit of the cross and suffering besides the use of it to implant in us God's word is that God uses trial and suffering to make us aware of our sins and to keep us from future ones. Uh, friends, we're, we're dull people. We're thick-headed. And God in his loving grace is faithful to not cast the whole lot of us into judgment for it. He seeks to convert us and then make us wise that we might avoid sins in his wrath. And so he uses cross and trial to, to teach us. Sometimes we're we can grasp it. Oh, yeah, okay. I get it. Even all the saints in the past whom we admire and look up to their faith learn to avoid this and that sin by trial and affliction. And, and, even, and it's recorded for us in the prophet Isaiah. He said, but what could I say? For God himself sent this sickness. You could say this trial, okay? Now I will walk humbly throughout my years because of this anguish I have felt. Lord, your discipline is good, for it leads to life and health. So, friends, God uses trial and affliction to make us aware of our sins and to keep us from repeating them and keep us from future sins. Yet another benefit of, of God that comes through cross and trial is the desire for heaven and God's presence there. And this is hard for young people to grasp because they tend to think heaven ought to be here on earth. Foolish, youthful thinking looks at earthly thrills and pleasures of this kind or that as heaven. But we Christians who have lived longer and have been honed by trial and cross know better. We've learned, usually by trial and error, of the deceitfulness of earthly pleasures the deceitfulness of earthly pleasures and how they come and go and they often lead, leave a trail of tears and sorrow in their wake. And through it all, the true Christian learns to desire Christ's return. When they will be taken from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. where there will be no more tears or sorrow of any kind. It's trial and affliction that teach us to long for the joys of heaven. Let me close with this, friends. That to the one who perseveres through trial and cross, God brings great comfort and joy. Okay, Jesus, our Lord, consider him. He was tormented beyond our comprehension in the last 
24 hours of his life. He swept drops of blood in his anguish in the garden. He suffered the taunts of his countrymen on the cross. Worst of all, worst of all, he suffered God's full wrath against our sin and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's trial. That's affliction. And yet come Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead victorious. Great joy followed his little while. Joy for himself, joy for others. And Christ's victory over sin, over death, over the devil, over God's wrath is yours to be enjoyed now, knowing that God forgives you your sins for Christ's sake, but it will be enjoyed fully when Christ returns and you are in heaven. So friends, do not let trial and suffering discourage you like Moses, like Moses who threw a tree into the bitter waters of Marah for the Israelites, this made the water sweet. So too can you and I make our current sorrows sweet when we throw in the cross of Christ. Then and only then do our sorrows have meaning. Then and only then do our crosses have value and they lead to the sweetness of eternal life. We can learn, and we ought to, with God's help, the good Easter hymns like we sang earlier. Jesus lives, the victory's won. Death no longer can appall me. Jesus lives, death's reign is done. From the grave will Christ recall me. Brighter scenes will then commence. This shall be my confidence. Amen. The peace of God that transcends all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.